So it really is my pleasure to host uh, this session with four very impressive panellists on aerosol generating procedures. Do they even exist? And it's a COVID-19 session. I'm sorry, you've done so well to still be sitting here and tolerating a COVID-19 session. I won't be offended if a few people leave now that they realise what the topic is. Um, we've got uh, Joe Simpson, Forbes McGain here, Andy Shrimpton and Tim Cook both dialling in from the UK. Uh, and each will have a few things to say on some different topics related to these aerosol generating procedures and then we'll have some time for uh, panel questions at the end. So without further ado, I will introduce Joe Simpson. Uh, Joe is an intensive care physician and anaesthetist at Eastern Health, which is a major metropolitan health system here in uh, Melbourne, Australia. Joe has published um, most significantly a, a high impact paper on the uh, aerosol box last year and is the inaugural recipient of the John Smith Airway Award, uh, of which I think she should be very proud. Um, and Joe woke up at one o'clock Melbourne time to get a flight from New Zealand here uh, to be here with us today, which we particularly appreciate. Uh, so if she if she zones off for a second or two, cut her some slack. <laughs> thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, you'll have to excuse my slightly husky voice. Uh, it's not COVID. It's uh, something spread from my aerosol generating uh, children. So bear with me. All right. So I'm going to kind of set the scene, really, with a story of um, what's been happening with COVID um, from the start, two and a half years ago, and the story of the aerosol protection device. So, um, as Jonathan said, I'm from Birmingham, where the Commonwealth Games was this year. I trained in Cambridge and now live in Melbourne. And like a lot of you here, you probably have friends, family, colleagues um, that lived abroad lived in Europe and we saw what was happening over there. And it was a difficult time to see the COVID numbers increasing, anxiety spreading, healthcare workers um, dying. And it didn't help when the World Health Organization and Medicines and Frontier started releasing um, articles saying that um, there wasn't enough PPE to um, look after healthcare workers during this difficult time. And this was mostly because um, China was producing most of the world's PPE at that point. Um, we had closed borders, um, import and export was down, and of course, um, demand was up. And what did we know about COVID then? Well, we knew, um, it's highlighted in this paper here from Lancet of Infectious Diseases, that those patients that were sickest had highest viral loads and remained positive for some days. And we thought at that time it was droplet spread, so we were told to stay two metres um, from people. And of course, in the healthcare setting, you've got the worst patients with the highest viral loads, and it's very difficult to stay two metres away from your um, patients. Now, if you plug in aerosol generating procedures into PubMed, you can see... Um, there's not much until there's a big spike when um, COVID um, came onto the scene. And prior to then, um, it was mostly um, procedures based around dental procedures and the risk of, of TB. I'm going to move on from that because some of the other panellists are going to talk in a bit more about the uh, aerosol generating procedures and what that actually means and what the definition could be. And the WHO um, gave a huge list of what potentially could be an aerosol generating procedure. And part of this was um, trying to protect um, the healthcare workers from um, getting COVID. Um, and so some of this may be slightly different now, and we'll be talking about that later with some of the other panellists. Plug-in aerosol boxes, protection boxes. Again, you get the same kind of peak around when um, COVID occurred. In the 60s and 70s, most of the aerosol protection devices were surgical face masks, respirators, or um, bioprotection boxes in, in labs. The first kind of device that looked like something covering the patient was in 1989, which was actually a device to protect um, doctors doing cranial autopsies so that they didn't catch um, CJD. But you can see it's starting to look a little bit like the, the boxes that we are familiar with today. 
And so back to the box for the COVID box. So this Taiwanese doctor became famous producing this box to try and cover the patient to protect the healthcare worker who may or may not be able to have PPE. And it was made famous by this well-known letter now in Nedjam by Kanali et al, which um, had a fluorescent balloon which blew fluorescent dye into the laryngoscopist's face. And you can see the reduction in droplet spread um, when the box was, um, was utilized. And this picked up huge um, uh, resources around the world trying to design a box, a drape. And there was many different people, engineers, F1 sports motor enthusiasts, trying to protect um, healthcare workers. Everybody was trying to be really innovative. This scoping review and narrative synthesis at, um, in BJ in September 2020 looked at about 52 articles that were published trying to examine some of the evidence um, that we had of these boxes. And as you can see, most of it was correspondence, letters, um, experimental reports, technical descriptions. And you'll all recognize the evidence um, pyramid. As you go up the evidence pyramid, the quality of evidence improves. Their research methodology is better. Their stats um, produce less um, error, and hopefully there's less bias. Things like expert opinion at the bottom of the um, pyramid is often heavily um, dependent and, and biased with uh, political views, for example, and we all know how uh, political COVID is. And so some of these letters and motorsports enthusiasts are probably even lower on the, um, on the pyramids. And I kind of say that tongue-in-cheek because we were in a difficult time. We were trying to um, do the best we could um, for, for patients and protecting us as well. And then in the first paper, really, to look at the safety of these boxes was actually Jonathan's paper, who's just won the Felicity Hawker Prize Award. So well done, Jonathan, at the College of Intensive Care Medicine um, a couple of days ago. Um, looked at some of the problems that we could get with this box. And he found that, looking at a couple of generations of boxes, that time to intubation was potentially prolonged, and also there was damage to PPE. And during this time, um, I felt we were quite lucky in Australia. We were already socially isolating. Borders were closed. We were watching what was happening overseas, and we were having a little bit more time to try and prepare ourselves for what was coming. And so we had a little look at these boxes. Um, we looked at no device, which is the bottom left hand of the screen there, a kind of tented-like drape, which is the top um, left, the aerosol box that you probably know um, and seen well with the armholes in, um, a vertical type drape, and then this um, sealed box up in the right hand corner was produced by a local um, um, first person that was um, dealing with uh, making semiconductors actually, and he came with his um, particle counter. And he designed this box, which had two kind of armholes in the side. It was very sealed. You can see it's very small and totally impractical. And it had to filter on the top, and you could either apply suction or, or not apply suction. And he wanted to see how that worked. So what we did is we generated um, aerosols by using uh, nebulized saline. And then we coughed every 30 seconds to see if there was any um, leakage of aerosols. Um, by counting particles from this particle counter that was situated at the laryngoscopist's head. And we had seven um, people doing this. We, each of them did each experiment, so kind of 42 trials. Um, and then we looked at the median amount of particles that were released. And this is the kind of mini uh, slide from the paper. Um, along the bottom is um, the time series. So we did it over five minutes, and then we took um, the box away and measured for another minute. And then there's the median total airborne particle count on the side. And the colored lines, um, they represent the different devices. So the line along the bottom shows the sealed box, which was on suction, so that um, little tiny box that my head was stuck in there. Um, then there was the sealed box without suction to the red line. The yellow line was the vertical plastic sheet. 
The green line was actually no intervention. You can see that's very much huddled within um, the other devices. And then the purple line was the horizontal sheet. But I think what's really important is the um, gold line at the top. And as you can see, with every cough, there was a spike of aerosols, which were essentially coming out of the armholes where you put your arms um, and increasing the exposure to um, healthcare workers of, of, of aerosols. And this was significantly significant. And so following this on the basis of, of Jonathan's paper and uh, mine, the FDA actually withdrew the use of these boxes in, in managing patients that may be COVID or, or have COVID. So it had a big impact on the world and it was good to um, think about safety of healthcare workers at this time. And then following that, there was starting to get a bit more rigorous with our methodology and, and, uh, and testing on these devices. And this systematic review and meta-analysis of around 40 um, papers kind of replicated what we'd found, increased time to intubation, potential of spread of aerosols, um, lower first pass success rates, damage to PPE, and, and of course, potential for high velocity air jets, which is what we think happens within the box due to the Bernoulli principle. So what then? Well, I highly encourage innovation. It's what moves medicine forward. And, but we have to think that sometimes great ideas in medicine can be dangerous, and so it's important to make sure we test what we're doing and work by the best evidence medicine to protect clinicians and, of course, patients. Um, we need some more robust research me methodology into these um, devices. And there's some questions that come out from this is, um, you know, what are aerosol generating procedures? What are the patient factors associated with this? Because obviously we were looking at coughs, we were using as higher aerosols that we could generate. Um, doesn't really compare necessarily with, with real life, but how much do these aerosols, when they are produced, actually cause an infection? And I think some of the other uh, panelists were going to be talking about that in a while. And so with that, I uh, thank you very much for listening to my croaky voice. Thanks so much, Joe. We'll save questions till the end. Next, I'd like to introduce... Uh, Associate Professor Forbes McGain, who I think is a bit of a polymath when it comes to contributions to intensive care research and has published significant uh, research in regards to environmental and financial sustainability uh, and social welfare in healthcare. He's going to be talking to us about uh, a significant contribution that he made uh, to the pandemic here in Melbourne. Uh, Forbes is an intensive care physician and an ethicist at Western Health, which is another major metropolitan health service here in Melbourne, uh, and is two types of associate professor, one at the University of Melbourne and one at the University of Sydney, uh, which is quite impressive. Thank you very much, Forbes. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks to the SAS uh, and for those who are online as well. Uh, I have some disclosures to make. Uh, I've made a small amount of money uh, from Medihood, which is being patented and licensed now from the device we're going to talk about. Uh, Jason Monty is the principal co-inventor from the University of Melbourne. Uh, he's the head of mechanical engineering. Uh, CSIRO, uh, Department of At Atmospheres and Oceans, I love that term, they've been involved. And Evan Evans and Westerflex are local manufacturers of the, the hood that I'm going to talk about. Very much the Western Health Intensive Care research team are involved, and I really want to thank all the nurses here because we talk about aerosol generating procedures. They're the ones who are the, that are with the patient for the most amount of time and, and the closest proximity, uh, and, and so really we did it for them. This uh, photo just shows the back of house of um, the intensive care unit at Footscray. It's open planned, it's old, and in March 2020 we were worried uh, because aerosols were going to be everywhere. Um, I mentioned that uh, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health of the USA uh, they talk about the hierarchies of control. And so in, early, uh, in February and March of 2020, we started to think, well, PPE in the red is all very good, but um, we're not sure that this is not an aerosol-borne uh, virus and we should be looking at other ways to control it. And engineering controls was one of the ones we could do. We couldn't eliminate the patient. Um, we couldn't substitute the patient, so those two are gone. But you could work with engineering controls to try and make it safer as long as administrative and then finally PPE. 
And we were all worried. Uh, there was a lot of things, as Joe has already mentioned, going on in Italy, New York and other places. You could see these bell hoods that people were wearing. I wore one of those and it was most unpleasant. Um, and uh, we were also aware of intensive cares that were full of people in PPE and looking like they were from uh, the moon. Uh, and there was worries about aerosol generating procedures and there was also things going on with extreme levels of, of trying to prevent aerosols being, getting out and affecting the healthcare worker. So yes, why have I got a pram here? Because it was in the back of my mind that we need something like a pram to sort of bring the negative pressure room to the patient because there weren't going to be enough negative pressure rooms. And we, we got together with particularly Jason Monty and his team. Uh, we had a lot of input from nurses, doctors and even ex-ICU patients. Uh, to look at something that we could invent that was going to actually make it safer for the patient and for the healthcare worker. Why safer for the patient? Because we were intubating people unnecessarily. There was no doubt that we were doing that early on in March 2020. We were intubating asthmatics and not, no, you know, we weren't allowed to use nebulizers and all that sort of thing was going on. So we had a lot of support from the team. Uh, that's me in the left-hand corner. And you can see Jason uh, in the foreground there in the water, in the water tunnel. Uh, that's at Melbourne Uni. And uh, Will Lee in the background. Don't drop the computer. Uh, so there was, um, that, that's what they normally do. They normally play in water. They deal with ships. Uh, they also deal with aircraft. Uh, and they're all about fluid mechanics. Uh, Rose Chong, you can see those in the background there, the, all the spools of cotton. Uh, Rose is a, an expert in making things uh, and fabrics and very important for the initial design of the hood and the canopy that we're using the PVC cover. Uh, Sam Bates, the head of the, the research manager at uh, ICU Western Health, was great as well. So here's one weekend in late March, everyone went slightly mad. The rest of the university was all shut down. We had, so we, we had a carte blanche to have lots of fun. Uh, and we started putting together something that was going to look like what could be on a patient bed and still be, be safe and comfortable. Uh, that's Jason in the foreground. You can see at the bottom here, the rest of the team hard at work. Then we brought it out to Western Health and we started sort of playing around with it, prototype number one, and starting to develop it on, on a real patient. You can see in a prone position, you know, we're using staff in this situation to do that. And we went through a lot of iterations, a lot of prototypes. We went up to about Mark 10 before we got, gave up giving numbers to it. Uh, and you can see the device is pretty simple. It's basically the green at the bottom is a filter. That's a, an eight, a HIPAA 13 filter. It's like a 99.99% um, scrubber of viruses and anything you know, uh, of, a, of a certain size. At the top, you've got, sorry, in the black there, um, in the sort of central piece behind the patient bed is the actual uh, fan. And so you're just drawing air away from the healthcare worker up over the top of the patient down the bottom. Why was it done that way? Because we got computational fluid dynamics from the team there to say that's going to be the place to put, put the actual inlet port and the exit port. is really It's really like a, a ventilator in a way. I mean, we, we forget that actually ventilators are uh, actually constantly pushing air out that they've taken in, but it's been filtered as well. So it's, it's a system of scrubbing the air internally. And I don't think I've worked so hard in all my life, so I'll go back. Um, we published that in May, 2020, in May 2020, so two months it was out and in the press. Uh, and we'll go through a little bit of the testing of it, because I think what Joe was saying is that you really got to test this stuff. And all the back of my mind is saying, yes, it's good, but hang on, we need someone to work out what we're doing actually makes a difference. So, yes, I sat in this little covered area and felt how, discovered just how unpleasant BiPAP is. Uh, and we measured aerosol counts. So this isn't virus, because they couldn't just fill me up with virus. Uh, instead, we measured aerosol. So you can see this is me. Uh, this is, what, this is a, um, a logarithmic scale. So you can see the y-axis is the number concentration. And you can see on the bottom all the different things that I'm doing. Uh, and what it's showing you immediately is that you can see things like, oh, sorry, I'll just go to the next slide. Thing, I won't mention breathing and talking, which themselves are fairly low risk activities, but all the things we thought were aerosol generating was, mm, okay, that's interesting. They're, they're fairly low numbers. We're talking about one uh, aerosol count per mil of, of air. Um, but certainly what we found was different was the BiPAP that seemed to be a hundredfold greater than the other things that we're using. So whether you're using high flow oxygen or just a normal face mask didn't seem to make a difference, but BiPAP made a big difference. Uh, the other thing that, of course, that went through the roof, a 10,000 fold increase, because remember it's logarithmic, um, between the uh, face mask at the, in the centre there versus the top, which is the nebulizer, it, much, much greater use of aerosols. Of course, the aerosols are not coming from me, they're coming 
coming from the nebulizer, but the problem is that it only takes a few of my virions to get out and go on the nebulizer, and then you've got a bit of trouble. So nebulizers are bad. We knew that beforehand, but it was just important to have as a positive control. So the big takeaway message is high flow oxygen didn't appear to be an aerosol generating procedure, but BiPAP, mm, that seems to be a bit of a worry. Um, then what we did was we used the hood. Uh, these are box and whisker plots. Um, you, the, the black is the without the hood bit working, so you just open it up uh, and turn the fan off. And the green is with the with the fan working and the hood down. Now the the main points I want to say is that obviously in breathing and talking are low risk. Now there's no difference of whether the hood's on or not. It's because it's there, it's at, at the limits of detection. So even with these super duper fifty thousand dollar devices that CSIRO provided us with, it's hard to actually you know there's a random variation going there. You have a clean room, but it's still difficult to work out what's going on. When you start talking about the wet cough and the face mask and the nasal humidifier, you do start to see a difference. You can see the black being the um, with, with the hood off and the fan off, but the green is the hood down and fan on, and so you start to see a drop by at least 10, maybe 100-fold, and similarly a 100-fold drop. It's still a rise with BiPAP, so you can still see if someone is in the hood with the BiPAP running, it's about the same order of magnitude as if someone was with a face mask and nothing, no protection going on no hood running so it's to say that the hood will reduce the count but it won't reduce it to zero it's it's not it's not a closed system the idea is that the hood is it's not truly a negative pressure room but there's a slight negative pressure that's drawing air into the patient and away from the healthcare worker and so once again that's why you're seeing with a nebulizer uh, there is a hundredfold drum, drop but you know it's not it's not fully protective that's why you still got to wear your, your n95 so the other thing that we did was we just ran the nebulizer multiple times, sorry, I'll go back, and that shows um, that the efficacy of the hood is around 98, 99%. So similar to those previous studies, it drops. We're deliberately stressing the hood in this sense. We're just running the nebulizer flat out, and we're deliberately trying to stress it and release aerosol everywhere um, in order to see how efficient it is. And it was around 98, 99%, depending on the size of the aerosols you're talking about. Most human aerosols are between uh, the 0.5 micron to 20 microns, sort of 10 to 20 uh, in terms of numbers. We produce a few you can see, which I might be producing right now, I speak volubly, but um, mo that's not the number that counts. It's actually the numbers are all in those small numbers around one micron. Then we started manufacturing, uh, and that's local manufacturing in the back of house and the University of Melbourne. Gee, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, this work. Um, and then we did a clinical trial. Now, doing a clinical trial, my goodness, it was real effort. Uh, it was great work on the part of, of the team. You can see the banking up there of the open band ICU. Some of these patients are intubated, some of them are not. Uh, and we found very quickly that it was, you know, this is a story about unintubated patients uh, because when you intubate it, you've got the protection of the actual ventilator. Uh, we published in uh, a local, the local RAG and we were very happy about that process of getting the, the, sh the story going. So there's no randomised controlled trials, but um, we were able to get some evidence there behind the scenes. And now uh, uh, got, you can even be on an ex exercise bike um, and we're using it now in, in many places in the intensive care and more importantly in the emergency department, etc. I will mention that we're going ongoing, we're doing some exciting work now with Monash and the Doherty Institute at uh, Melbourne Uni. Uh, here is Leo, he's hooking up, uh, about to blast a, a virus everywhere, you can see it being puffed out there for a little nebulizer. This is a phage, so it's not nasty to me, but it's nasty to E. coli, you can see the plates down the bottom there. So basically we're testing now in a mock viral environment uh, to see, well, okay, is this effective against a virus of some sort in the hood? So, um, and what we, I'm really excited about is the device you can see on the far left there, which is actually, uh, it captures the virus from the, from the um, surrounding air, and it's called and it, it's, it's called the virus machine, and sucks in the air, and then you're able to plate out the virus and, and where it's been um, effective in knocking off the um, E. coli. So now I'm really excited by this. Uh, we're, we've managed to uh, show also that there's also a, a similar sort of fold reduction, you know, at least, uh, in other words, we're, we're stopping 99% of the bugs or virus or whatever you want to see from getting out from the hood with a, uh, with a mock patient being in there. Why does this all make sense? It all makes sense to me because here's our little red dots for the viruses. Um, if you start to wear PPE, you don't actually reduce the number of viruses in the air, you just stop them from getting into your mouth. 
Um, you can start using HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. In the ICU, it's six air changes per hour. In the operating theatre, it's 20 minimum. So the operating theatre is the safest place to be in the entire hospital. Um, you can start putting in filters. You've all seen those little filters around here. I'm surprised there's none here right now. Uh, and um, you can also start, you know, as I mentioned, in the negative pressure room, which is 12 air changes per hour. Uh, but what the hood does is just try to make your little mini environment with about 100 air changes per hour. So that's, that's the hood. The hood's air exchange is about 100. The operating theory is about 20. The ICU is about 6. And so that's why it's effective. It just has a very high air exchange rate. It wouldn't have that if we were trying to clear, clean this entire room. But because the, the volume of that hood is around 1.3 metres cubed, I know all this stuff, I'm afraid, um, then, then that's why it works. So it's out there, it's at long reach, it's in New Zealand, it's in various other places, and it's been great to be involved in the process of developing a real thing that, that people actually want and, and, and like using. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much. It's a remarkable project, I think. Mm. Uh, next, we have two presenters from the UK, hopefully, if the uh, systems are all up and working. I'd like to acknowledge that it's also a ridiculous hour of the morning there. Is it, is it 4.30, uh, Andy, or something in that order? Uh, it's 6 o'clock now, actually. It's not oh, OK. Well, still not super pleasant. OK, by cardiac and the standards. So Andy, Andy Shrimpton's an advanced uh, anaesthesia trainee in the UK and is a doctoral candidate at the University of Bristol. Uh, and he's done some very impressive work on quantifying uh, aerosol-generating procedures with the aerator studies. And without further ado, I'll let you get on with it. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's very uh, yeah, honoured to be, kind of be here to speak today. Um, not face-to-face, -face, unfortunately, but... I'm just going to walk through kind of the areas of this, like what our methodology has been in terms of how we've approached the question and a bit about some future studies as well. And so I'll just move on from there. Um, essentially, I know that Joe mentioned it already, but the aerosol generating procedure is the thing that has driven all this research and all this work. And this was coined back in 2014 by the World Health Organization. And each procedure to be defined as this had to have two components. So it had to generate aerosol but also increase the risk of disease transmission. But the evidence basis behind um, this, this designation was 10 very kind of poor quality epidemiological studies from the SARS 2003 outbreak. Um, and there's no aerosol measures whatsoever. And the other thing that's quite important to remember is that at the start of the pandemic, the only way that aerosolized virus was thought to spread was via the AGP. And everything else was kind of contact uh, and thermite. So not it didn't happen any, anywhere else. And we know now that is patently wrong. But this had a profound effect on our day-to-day -day work in life. Um, again, going back to the PPE. And so this gentleman is Jules Brown. He's a, a consultant uh, anaesthetist and intensive care doctor in Bristol. And he was reading the, new, the newspaper and he saw this gentleman mentioned. And this is Jonathan Reed. He's a professor of um, aerosol science based in, in Bristol. And he was kind of quoted for talking about looking at aerosolized virus during speaking, breathing, and coughing. And it transpires that he was undertaking a lot of work in a level three laboratory in Bristol, looking at the original SARS virus. And then they, they changed track tack as uh, COVID came along. He's also the president of the Aerosol Society of the UK and head of the Bristol Aerosol Research Centre. And so it seemed like a really good person potentially to contact and reach out to. And so Jules spoke to him and said, you know, we've got this real problem. These procedures that we do every day all around the world, are being classified as being an aerosol generated procedures, but there's no aerosol evidence to, to kind of back that up. But it's having a profound impact on what we do. Is there a way we can measure this and, and work this out? And one of the big problems that Jonathan was worried about is that the background aerosol concentration is very, very difficult to kind of um, to control against. It can fluctuate on a daily basis and even on an hourly basis. And he knows that kind of the respiratory aerosol that you generate is very, very low. And so often you just can't see it in the background, but said, you know, let, let's try and see what, what we can do. And so they brought in an array of different particle counters up into an ultra clean operating theatre. We've got quite a few of them in Bristol. And they turned them on and they thought that they weren't working at first. And it became apparent that this background was so clean uh, that, that, that this potentially could be the perfect laboratory environment in which the procedures are undertaken and the background is so clean that you can see things against a virtual zero, zero background. 
And I'm just going to go through that background uh, with you, like why it's so important. So in these ultra clean ventilation systems where you've got about 600 air changes per hour, the background is virtually zero. And if you cough against that, you can see that quite clearly above, above the background. If you then put that same ventilation system into standby mode, you knock it down to about 25 air changes per hour, which is what the UK kind of um, mandated number of air changes per hour is. And you've, you're going to benefit from that kind of clean environment, but you've got a much lower kind of air change, and you still see the coughs. But if you turn that system off, you get background aerosol coming in from different parts of, 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 the, of the building. And if you try and subtract that background from what you see there to try and find those coughs again that are in there, it's exceptionally hard to do that. And that's why we thought actually this, this could be potentially a, a doable project. And so, as I say, they brought a, a number of different particle counters. And the one we settled on is an optical particle size load that essentially draws air through, goes through an infrared um, light and gets scattered. And it measures particles between kind of 10 microns down to 0.3. So anything below 10 microns can get into your upper airways, below five microns can get down to your alveolar level. And with the sampling at one, once per second, you can then um, ascribe an event to that kind of number concentration that's been snapshotted. And we connected this to a sampling funnel so we could then direct towards the procedure that we were interested in. And so we've evolved our methodology over time. And so the work that Jonathan had been doing, they wanted to try and get as much as possible. And they wanted to get the, the these, they often had performers or singers and, and orators, and they got them so close to the, to, to the funnel to, to uh, decrease the amount of dispersion and dilution. But to manage the airway, that's just not possible. And so what we did see that is that at half a meter away, we could um, record an aerosol, a cough uh, above the background. And because a cough is a known aerosol, generating events, so it generates aerosol, but it was not classified as being high risk. That was our benchmark for the start of our, our studies. So actually, if it generates more aerosol than a cough, then it must be high risk. And then over time, um, we've realized that if you get closer to the patient, you can measure their breathing above the background in this environment as well. But again, to get closer, we've had to make our funnels smaller. So we've just kind of got closer and a bit more kind of compact over time. And the procedures that we've looked at, amongst others, has been uh, tracheal intubation and extubation, superglottic airway use, uh, and mask ventilation, which I'll just run through briefly. And so if I plot that cough that Jules, that you saw Jules do, this is the first seven coughs um, kind of plotted out with, again, time along the x-axis versus uh, aerosol concentration. We see this rapid transient spike in aerosol that dissipates in the, in the next 10 to 15 seconds or so. If we then look at tracheal intubation on the same axis, there is just no signal. So it does not generate this huge plume of aerosol when you insert a plastic tube in a paralyzed and anesthetized patient. In the same vein, same vein, when you're waking a patient up, they're then able to breathe and cough and speak at that stage. But again, the removal of that plastic tube doesn't generate this huge plume of aerosol. There's a bit more because the patient's able to kind of generate it themselves. But again, it's not a, a big risk above, certainly against a cough as well. When we looked at the, the uh, superglottic airways uh, data again, it's very similar pattern. So the insertion of the device and the removal did not generate this big spike of aerosol. Um, as I say, obviously our methodology has evolved over time and we then changed from having a standardized cough to compare against to the participants' own kind of um, respiratory mechanics because we know there's quite a lot of interpersonal variation. And so we get a participant to, to breathe and to cough, which we, we could see again above the baseline. And then we looked at other components. So in this study, we looked at mass ventilation with no leak. So we had a, a really good CO, we could ventilate the patient, and we had the, the sampling funnel 20 centimeters away. And then we also generated an intentional leak and measured next to that leak to see that uh, it's kind of the worst case scenario. So you're able to kind of ventilate the patient. You haven't got a great leak, so a lot of the air that they are um, exhaling is kind of coming out the side of the mask. And what we found was that with no leak, all the aerosol is you know, contained within the circuit. And with a leak, you do see some aerosol, but it, again, it's less than when the patient's awake, breathing and talking. So again, it wasn't this huge risky procedure that, that, that we were undertaking. And we also looked at um, uh, kind of upper airway suction as well. So uh, laryngopharyngeal suction with the Yanka sucker device. And we brought a lot of these components together in the study where we had the patient's own uh, baseline recordings of breathing and coughing over the background. And then we put the rest of the intubation sequence in there. So we had mass ventilation, we had tracheal intubation, which is designated by little asterisks there. 
and then we looked at suction either side of that dime. And then we looked at uh, tracheal extubation and again suction either side of that. And again, it just matched, it all kind of came together and said actually, it's the patient awake, breathing and coughing that generates the aerosol. It's not these procedures, they don't generate this big plume of aerosol. Um, we have seen aerosol, and so we did a, a, a study looking at um, awake tracheal intubation. And we found that when a patient is, is undertaking this procedure, um, we had, again, we had our baseline recordings of breathing and coughing. There were a number of different events that happened during that procedure where the patient either took a, a big deep breath or they coughed or they sneezed during the procedure. And that generated very similar aerosol levels to, it, to their own coughing. But when we sprayed uh, local anesthetic on their visualized vocal cords, that generated a huge plume of aerosol, far above anything we'd seen. And so again, we, we ascribe that that is much, much higher risk compared to um, kind of tracheal intubation in a weight patient. And, and that, that's the important thing, it's the, it's the state of the patient, not the procedure, that is the risk for generating aerosol. And in a similar vein, we looked at um, upper, GI, upper GI endoscopy. And so if this was done, again, this was in awake patients or with some kind of conscious sedation, if you perform this procedure and it's smooth and the patient doesn't cough, again, it doesn't generate aerosol above the patient's own background breathing and coughing. But if they do cough, which is that big spike kind of towards the end at around about 600 seconds, you do get a big spike in aerosol. But again, it's the state of the patient. The patient can breathe and cough, and it's that that generates the aerosol, not the procedure itself, as shown by kind of the, the timeline above that. And so the findings from our studies have managed to kind of influence the UK's uh, IPC, Infection Prevention Control Guidance, uh, back in June of this year. And trachea intubation and extubation, mass ventilation were, were removed from the list along with supercluster airway use has been uh, defined as being not aerosol generating. And we do appreciate that our sample size has been quite small. However, having that interpersonal kind of um, comparison really increases the, the strength of the studies. And there's a directional component uh, to the sampling, but again, by having that the funnel handheld, we can move that and the pa patient's head is moved. Um, and we've also studied this in, in non-infected patients. And it may be different, but um, I'm very confident in our results that we've seen so far. Um, so this is a nice kind of a graphic that's been produced by uh, a, a doctor in New Zealand um, who essentially has looked at, uh, has presented our, 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 our um, findings in a nice format. Essentially, it's that patients generate aerosol and many of these AGPs just do not inherently generate these big plumes of aerosol. So it's breathing, speaking, coughing that is far, far more risky than the procedure itself. Um, and in terms of just briefly mentioning our future work, so we're looking at CPR. Is that an aerosol generating procedure? And there are a number of different bodies around the world who have put out statements. And we just don't know. But what we do know is that since COVID has happened, there's been worse outcomes for both in and out at hospital cardiac arrest. And the problem with that is we haven't got a nice clean environment. We can't have lists going along that we can go and record in. And we've lost our comparative breathing and coughing. And so we've had to adapt our sampling technology. Essentially, what we've done is we've um, changed our sampling methodology to record from within the breathing circuit. And so we give kind of filtered um, oxygen to the patient uh, in their calic arrest, and then we can measure what is emitted during that, during that event. And to get over the kind of the, the number of currents, we've teamed up with a, a great Western air, air ambulance charity who provide kind of high quality um, advanced life support to patients with um, out, of hospital, out of hospital calic arrests. To try and collect this data and so far we've managed to recruit uh, a number of participants and hope to have the answers to that fairly soon. I just want to say it's been a huge amount of work to kind of get to this stage and a lot of people I'd like to thank you. Thanks as well. Thank you.